series lineup and is supported through generous funding from the Pittsburgh Foundation. In addition to those joining us on Zoom, we are also live streaming on Facebook and welcome questions from both virtual spaces as we go. As you listen to our speakers, you are encouraged to share questions for them in the chat or Q&A sections found at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Please include who your question is directed to, otherwise we will assume both speakers are encouraged to answer. We are also recording this webinar and we'll make it available on our library's YouTube channel in the coming days. For those in Zoom, we also have our live transcript enabled. You can access that at the bottom of your screen where it says live transcript and then show subtitle. Likewise, you can click that button again and hit hide subtitle if it gets to be too much. Finally, the following community agreements have been written for this virtual event. By participating today, you are agreeing to the following, that everyone in this virtual environment has the same fundamental values as I do, and I will not belittle or demean anyone in the space, speak in I statements that do not generalize beyond my own experiences, participants represent only themselves and are not representatives of social groups or political parties, attending with the intention to engage with others and be in community, not to hurt each other or score points for argumentation, not to oversimplify complex events or topics. Embrace the blurry or confusing parts of an issue. Listen harder when you disagree and notice your own defensive reactions and to stay engaged rather than closed off to reach a deep point of understanding. Approach this virtual event with curiosity by asking questions rather than making assumptions about what others mean. And finally, to challenge myself to say what I really mean by communicating directly, honestly, and genuinely. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, Letha Nutt and Deborah Caldwell Stone. Letha Nutt is the Deputy Director of Policy at State Voices and focuses on issues such as voting rights, election protection, and redistricting. She's also a fellow at the Freedom Forum, where she serves as a subject matter expert on First Amendment law and frequently writes about the intersection of law, technology, and expression. Deborah Caldwell Stone is the director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom and executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation. Her work addresses a wide range of intellectual freedom issues, including book bans, internet censorship, meeting room policies, and the privacy of library users' records. She also advises ALA's Intellectual Freedom Committee and its Privacy Subcommittee on Law and Policy Concerns, and has served on the faculty of the ALA-sponsored Lawyers for Libraries and Law for Librarians workshops. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting us. All right, so we are gonna get started. We had so many great questions submitted through registration, and we also wanna leave time for some live questions to get addressed. And I am going to uh, pose this question to you both, but we're gonna start with Litha. Can you please share a little about your professional background and why you were so invested in your First Amendment work? Of course. So Jessica, as you said, um, I'm a fellow at the Freedom Forum, and that is a nonpartisan organization that's dedicated to educating Americans about how their free speech rights work, how they might be at risk, and how they could be protected. And I'm also the policy director, deputy policy director at State Voices, which is about supporting and protecting and expanding the right to vote. So those are two different areas of the law. And I believe that they are connected in the way that the highest purpose of speech is to bring out, out about a change in society. Um, and that's actually why I made the transition from working full time at the Freedom Forum into working at a voting rights organization. Um, and I, I strongly believe that voting rights are fundamental just as speech rights are fundamental, that they should be protected in a similar man manner. And ultimately, I'm invested in both of these types of work because I believe that they're what give the people power. They're what allow us to impact the world around us. Same question to you, Deborah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, I began my career as a filmmaker and journalist, but soon moved into the law. I spent many years in private practice doing appellate advocacy, um, working on appeals, post-trial motions. But uh, 20 years ago, I was offered the opportunity by ALA 
to jump into the defense of the freedom to read. And it's something that I deeply believe in. Um, and it was really a great opportunity that I seized upon. And since then, I have been working as my, you know, as I noted in my biography, I've been working with libraries and library directors to make sure that everyone has free access to the resources in a library um, to get the materials they need to become educated about how society works, how the law works, to make decisions about their governance. And so, you know, a lot of ways to give expression through those, uh, that critical thinking through their voting uh, for candidates and participation in the democratic process. So um, that is uh, really the foundation is respecting the dignity and, and individuality of every person to make decisions for themselves, to learn for themselves, and then to give expression to that through their participation in society and um, participation in um, uh, political events. Excellent, thank you. And Deborah, we're gonna stick with you for this next one and then go over to Lotha. So the question is, why is censorship something you care about and why should others care? Well, I think my roots of caring about censorship are deeply personal, even go back to my childhood, in fact. I was an early reader and um, I found myself in situations where I could very easily read and comprehend a book but was told I wasn't allowed to access it in the library simply because of my age. And I felt that very deeply. I felt I should be able to make that choice. And since then that's matured into the idea that everyone should have the ability to make choices about their what they read, what they access, to have the freedom of speech um, and the ability to hear from everyone as they make up their minds about who they are, uh, what they want to do in their lives. Uh, in particular, I'm deeply, you know, I'm really committed to the fact that government should not be making those decisions for us. It shouldn't be the government controlling what we hear or read that you know, we do have the institution of a free press, we have publishing, we have individual uh, expression, uh, and which of course has exploded with social media and the internet, but um, that we shouldn't, the, the First Amendment is all about keeping the government out of those decisions, and I firmly support that idea. Thank you, and Lotha, same question to you on censorship. I don't like censorship because censorship is prejudgment. It's one thing to read something and hate it and denounce it and criticize it and say that it's like the worst thing you've ever read. But censorship doesn't even allow you to do that. It says that there are some thoughts and ideas or even facts that can't be expressed at all and that other people shouldn't be even be allowed to know that they exist. Um, that's such a powerful thing, right? Uh, many people and in institutions, they can serve as censors, but I'm with Deborah. For my money, it's the most dangerous thing when it's the government censoring expression. And I'm, I'm not an anti-government nut, but I do have a lot of healthy skepticism when institutions that were chosen by the public to serve the public make decisions about what information is available to the public. It's a conflict of interest higher than, than most others that I can think of. Excellent. So we're gonna stick with Litha for this uh, next question. How do you think the First Amendment has fared over the past few years? And when was the most recent tipping point where the First Amendment came under fire or was put to the test against present day challenges. It's interesting thinking about how the First Amendment has fared because of course, you're not just thinking about the First Amendment, you're thinking about which specific First Amendment freedom and how is that, that fared. And then you're looking at, there's a lot of different actors in our society who determine how like a certain freedom is doing. You've got to think about who you're looking at. Um, I mean, for the, to the first point, the First Amendment guarantees us five freedoms, um, religion, press, speech, petition, and assembly. And it might be one thing to say things have been pretty great for freedom of speech, but they could also have been pretty dismal for freedom of assembly. And that I believe is true right now, as you have states mm -hmm. that are enacting all sorts of anti-protest laws. Um, and also to my second point, that how the First Amendment is doing can hinge on how different people are treating it. Like if you take freedom of the press, Courts have been very protective of freedom of the press in the last few years. Um, they they have stood for it, and they've uh, and they have um, ha they've held high standards for for winning a libel lawsuit. They've um, they've protected access, I would say. But many journalists would describe the last few years as a really dark time for freedom of the press, and that's because of the public perception of the press. 
um, because of our former president's somewhat successful efforts in undermining the press's reputation and you know, because of the loss of funding for local journalism. So how things are doing isn't entirely a matter of legal protection. There's just a lot of factors that go into that. Um, and I think the biggest present day challenge that's putting the First Amendment to the test is of course the internet. Um, you know, the First Amendment was designed at a time when speech was hard, when it was expensive. If you wanted to communicate with a lot of people, you needed a printing press in your basement. Those are very bulky and, and not cheap. But nowadays, speech is free and easy and cheap, and anyone can broadcast their thoughts to billions of people with just a phone. And it's attention that is expensive. It's attention that's hard to come by. And the First Amendment doesn't say much about who we should be paying attention to. But in our world, in a way that I don't think uh, uh, people could have imagined um, even a few decades ago, attention is such a huge issue. And the algorithms and the mechanisms and the influencers that direct people's attention to certain topics or certain pieces of information or misinformation, that's crucial. And I would say the First Amendment it, um, does so many things for us and it protects vital expression, but it doesn't have a lot to say about that part of things. Yeah. Deborah, anything you'd like to add? to that no it's an excellent summary but i agree that it's external forces that are challenging our devotion to the principles uh, the freedoms represented by the first amendment and we see it in different ways uh, in libraries for example we're seeing incredible pressures to censor materials for young people and i can say more about that later but um, there's, there is an effort to change the narrative about the ability of young people to make decisions about what they read and access, particularly mature minors, um, and to deny them access to the materials they need to become informed voters, to form their identity, to simply be themselves. And, um, and so we're now seeing a shift in um, whether or not really going away from defending that principle and coming to a consensus that there needs to be more control over young people's reading. Excellent. I think you're already touching on this, but a question we received was, um, so the Office for Intellectual Freedom provides a wealth of resources and support for libraries who are facing challenges of censorship or pushback from these internal and external mm -hmm. forces you're mentioning. What would you say is a common topic of support that the Office for Intellectual Freedom, um, Intellectual Freedom provides that might be surprising to people who aren't like in the library world. Well, actually, it might be surprising to find that we regularly advise libraries on addressing demands for library users' records. Um, police will show up at the library, uh, sometimes with a warrant, sometimes without a warrant, asking to look at users records there's still a perception that what someone reads is uh, evidence of intent um, or can show that you have certain knowledge that would have facilitated the commission of a crime sometimes it's even just third party demands there's frankly a messy divorce and a parent wants to know what a child is reading and so we often advise libraries on adhering to state laws in particular that protect the confidentiality of every user's record and how to address those challenges. But you know, for us, it's very important because if people think that they're being observed in what they do in the library, what they're reading, that's a real chilling effect. You would start self-censoring and that's the opposite of any library's mission. We want to free people to make the inquiries they need to make. And so by protecting privacy, by advising libraries on how to address uh, government demands for records or third-party demands for library records and protect the privacy of library users, um, you know, we help facilitate that those freedoms. And so it's an interesting part of our work that you might not have thought of when you think about an, you know, an office that's dedicated to preventing censorship in libraries, but it's also really facilitating free access to all the materials and creating the conditions that support free access to materials in libraries. Litha, I want to stay on the surprising theme because I think uh, this is just a great opportunity for folks to learn about both of your specialties and what they didn't know. So from a legal standpoint, what have been some of the more surprising court cases involving the First Amendment, which we know is a very broad thing, 
uh, that you've seen either from the Supreme Court or state legislature? So I've got a couple things. Um, and the first one is, I don't know if this was surprising. It surprised some people, but um, in the last Supreme Court term, uh, the court decided what's commonly called the Snapchatting cheerleader case, um, where you had a high school student who failed to make the varsity squad. And then she put a post on social media where she unleashed some profanity against the school. Uh, she was suspended. She and her parents sued. And it's a subtle piece of law dating back to 1969 that students have First Amendment rights. But when they're in public school, um, teachers and administrators, they can place some limits on those rights. They can punish or censor speech that would disrupt the school environment. That's the rule. Um, but you know, since 1969, things have changed a bit. And now there was this question, what counts as being in school? Um, if you post something on social media from your bedroom at home, but the people you go to school with read it, are you at school, like metaphysically? Um, and how far does the reach of the school go? And you had different courts making different calls about this. So, you know, it was high time for actually the Supreme Court to step in and clear things up. And they sided with the student. Or maybe more accurately, they sided with her parents and said that it's not the school's job to punish students for off-campus speech. That's the responsibility of parents. But um, I, was, I, I, I was actually really happy with that decision because there does come a point where it's just like, well, if you're on social media and social media is touching the school, aren't you always at school? And that's sort of terrifying to comprehend. So um, I was surprised and sort of, and, and glad that they, they drew that line there. Um, another thing that I find surprising, but in a less pleasant way is that, um, so again, my other specialty is voting rights. And in the past couple of months, you've, uh, or in the past few months, you've had states pass tons of laws that place burdens on the right to vote. Um, you know, some of them, it, you know, making by making it harder to register or reducing the opportunity to vote early or by mail. But, you know, because I'm so interested in the overlap between speech and voting, what's also interesting to me is that some of these anti-voter laws um, are also anti-speech laws. Um, you have the laws that make it a crime to give waters to voters waiting in line at the polls. Um, you know, most people are like, that's just horrible. But like, as soon as I heard that, I was like, well, that's actually... I think that's a that's a First Amendment violation because giving water to voters is considered like a kind of interactive communication around like advocacy and political change, you know, in the same way that money is speech and symbols are speech. Like that kind of uh, that kind of activism, which is just to encourage people to vote. I think of that as a form of speech. And you also have laws that sort of limit news gathering about uh, around election processes um, and laws that just kind of limit what civic engagement volunteers can do to encourage people to register to vote. And all of that to me is speech. And I think it should be clear from these examples that voting isn't something that just occurs in a vacuum. It's the culmination of so many acts of speech and press and petition and association. And I, I think it's interesting that legislatures, many of them that are, um, will say that they're very supportive of First Amendment rights, but they're kind of going at them a little bit in order to get to voting rights. So I, I found that surprising and sad. Yeah. It, it seems sometimes to me that um, they support the First Amendment as long as the First Amendment is supporting what they want to um, express or take at part in. But all of a sudden, it doesn't apply when we're talking about things like, you know, the more current example is mm -hmm. um, materials dealing with anti-racism or Black American history and the effort right. to suppress the instruction or provision of that information to students both in K through 12 and universities. Um, I have to say that we were equally concerned about the um, uh, profane cheerleader case, uh, but for another reason, there was a perception that, well, actually a real invitation to the Supreme Court to expand um, a decision that, the, the Hazelwood decision that allows uh, government, uh, allows school officials to engage in selective censorship of student speech. And we were deeply concerned that a broad decision in favor of the school in that case would um, impair student press rights in particular. And so uh, we worked with the Student Press Law Center to file uh, an amicus brief uh, highlighting our concerns that it, you know, the invitation to give broad discretion to library school officials to censor student speech should not be taken up and that they should be thoughtful about any decision in order not to impair free speech rights for student journalists. 
So we're getting some live questions and they are pretty relevant to what we're talking about right now. So I'm gonna take a pause from our, our uh, registration questions to jump into some of these. And um, I'll let you both decide who is going to take this first one. Uh, this is in regards to the uh, profane cheerleader, which, wow, what a title. Um, <laughs> would the recent Supreme Court case have had a different outcome if the student had been enrolled in a private school? Yes, it would not have been a First Amendment case. Um, the First Amendment only stops the government from censoring and punishing your speech. And public schools are considered their agents of the government they're, since they're public schools. A private school, I always hate to tell like students this, a private school can actually um, limit your speech all that it wants. It's not a government actor. It's just a private actor limiting your speech and the First Amendment just doesn't apply there. Right, absolutely. Um, the other question that came through was, could both speakers address the problem of bad actors? This is a critical question right at this moment. Who or what can protect us against those who lie on purpose, if not the government? who protects the public against what used to be called propaganda. I don't know if Litha wants to take a stab first. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab. No one, oh, that sounds so dire, but honestly, I'm not sure if we can, and again, I'm not an anti-government person, um, I, but I don't think that it's, or I don't feel comfortable with the government playing that role of protecting us from, from falsehoods because I don't particularly want the government determining what's true and false. I don't really want Facebook mm -hmm. doing it. Um, it's a sad answer, but it's got to be ourselves. It's just, we have to build the, and it's, I, I'm, I'm going to let us off the hook a little bit. None of us are accustomed to a world where everything is online. Um, I remember as a kid learning about reference checking and you know using actual books and like what you need to do to ensure something's a good source. I don't think anybody knows exactly how to do it for, for online sources. We're learning, we're figuring it out, but we need to get better at thinking about what we read. And we need to develop the kind of critical thinking skills Deborah was talking about to like determine whether something is true or false ourselves. Yeah, and that's actually a role that libraries play in society as in, you know, as designated places for receiving information. And, you know, we, we've been having to grapple with this in library land. And, you know, we firmly stand behind the idea that, you know, libraries should be sources of truth, support facts, support um, uh, evidence-based inquiry and, and things. And that in um, doing its mission that not only do we defend truth, but libraries should be in the uh, avoid, you know, help avoid the distortion of truth as well as information institutions. And so um, we've been working with members to develop um, policies, protocols, statements that uh, address this issue uh, of media literacy, um, encouraging programs that teach media literacy, that provide tools to individual library users to understand the sources of information they're using and to evaluate them. Um, it's uh, a really important role for libraries to play these days. And it's really part, I, again, part of providing full access to information and enabling each individual to make decisions for themselves and to engage in that critical thinking. All right. Um, we, we have quite a few comments uh, in the chat and Q&A, so I'm going to go just a few more uh, through these and then we'll jump back to some of the questions we received ahead of time. Um, this is for Deborah. So I'd be curious to hear your thoughts around the shift in libraries away from the concept of neutrality being paramount in developing collections and programming toward contextualizing content through an equity, inclusion, and diversity lens. We often discuss the differences between making conscious de decisions around selection and deselection versus the perception of censorship. What trends do you see in libraries across the country in those terms? And that's in the chat in case you need to refer to it because I realize that is a... Yeah, and I, I confess I'm not following chat very closely. I, I am by necessity using my iPad to be here. So I'm a little limited on that. So I appreciate you sharing the chat with me. But I, you know, there is an evolving understanding of the library's role in the community and its commitment to social justice and intellectual freedom. Um, you know, and I'll freely acknowledge we shouldn't say libraries are 
quote unquote neutral. We are committed to a certain set of core values like intellectual freedom, diversity, equity, social justice. And we shouldn't be shy about advancing those parts of our mission and acknowledging them. So in that sense, we're not neutral. However, we have to be nonpartisan. We, libraries shouldn't be taking sides in partisan elections. That's not their role as a government agency. And libraries cannot discriminate. You know, everyone should get the same service, no matter what their background, beliefs, political affiliation. They should be able to come into the library and receive excellent service from the library and find information resources to serve their needs. But that said, that doesn't mean that the library can't advance its mission through programming, displays, um, uh, by programs like this. You know, making it clear that the library is in support of being a welcoming and inclusive institution that is serving the needs and in fact, is an, um, uh, actively engaged in the work of making up deficiencies from the past. We can all recognize that there were segregated libraries in the South. How do we fix that? And how do we make up for it today? And I know that libraries are deeply engaged in that programming. But in the end, we have to end up at respecting every individual's personal intellectual freedom and recognizing that our driving mission is to provide uncensored access to an inclusive set of resources and services for all people. And so it's, you know, it's a conversation we're going to continually have within the profession. It's um, um, an interesting needle that we have to thread to respect both intellectual freedom, but do social justice. But I think that as a profession and as institutions, we're fully capable of doing that. Okay, uh, so this is a question for uh, you both. I'm going to start with Alitha on this one. Um, what is censorship to one person is an appropriate restriction on speech to another? How can we frame discussions on the First Amendment in a way that recognizes that what we define as censorship is a reflection of our values? I love that question. Um, because I do think that everyone, it's, as Deborah was saying, where, you know, you have entities that are for the First Amendment, but then aren't when it comes to speech that they don't like. In a sense, like one of the great uniting things about human beings is that we're all very hypocritical. Like we tend to think that the First Amendment protects a speech that we like um, and that there's an exception. Somewhere there's an exception for the speech that we don't like. Um, and, you know, there's the theory of the First Amendment, um, the idea that it's the marketplace of ideas and that we get all the ideas out there. The best ideas will rise to the top. I mean, they'll probably take my First Amendment badge away from me, but I don't actually believe that. Like, I don't really think the best ideas always rise to the top. I mean, why would they? But I do believe that, you know, when you think of it like that, when you think of it as like the marketplace of ideas, I think when you approach it like that, you're like, well, I don't want toxic apples in my marketplace, you know, and marketplaces generally have standards for the goods that you purchase and sell. And um, so I don't like thinking of it like that. I think it's, um, it's not a marketplace. It's not like a, because it's not like all speech is valuable. Some speech is offensive and some speech is stupid and a lot of speech is pointless. Like let's, let's be honest about that. But I think of it this way, that our rights are indivisible. Um, your rights are my rights and that's true even if I hate you and I hate every single thing you've ever said. You know, It's more that I don't want to give the government the power to limit your speech rights because inevitably, that power will be used to limit my speech rights. It's not, uh, it's not a zero sum game when it comes to speech. It's more like what kind, what kind of limits do you want uh, the people in power to have over all of our speech? If you think of it that way, more than you think of it as mm -hmm. um, this is offensive to me and I think it needs to be censored, that changes the whole way, way you look at things. If you, if you stop when you're arguing to censor something, if you stop and think of it, like, is that a precedent that you wanna set? that things can be censored for this and that and the other reason. Could that inevitable, could that lead to some things that I think absolutely should not be censored being censored? I think that changes the game a little bit. It changes how you think about it. Absolutely. I often put it, do you wanna live under the rule you want to create? Are you willing to be subject to that rule or have it turned around on you? And we've confronted that with meeting room policies. 
you know, people say, well, they shouldn't be able to come into the library and have a meeting. Well, once you create that rule, then it can be easily turned around to exclude those programs or groups that you do want meeting in the library. And we've actually observed that happen. And so, you know, that's very much the point that we also make uh, that we, you know, you have to think about a rule of general, it becomes a rule of general applicability. And so when you create a censorship rule, you're creating a rule that will end up censoring your own speech or limiting your own rights. All right. Um, this is very likely a question for Deborah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can just tell we have so many library loving uh, attendees. Mm -hmm. Can you, you give pointers for libraries to counter the other side? When authors publish books and demand a library adds it to the library collection and accuses the library of censorship if it isn't added, even if it doesn't meet the library's collection development policy standards. Are there any key phrases that should be included in collection development policies or re reconsideration request forms that are particularly important or useful? Well, I'm going to step back a little bit and remind everyone that even though libraries are government agencies, they are limited public forms. They're limited public forms only for the receipt of information. So when the courts protect First Amendment rights in libraries, it's they generally protect the ability to access materials in the library and they protect against censorship of particular materials based on their content or viewpoint. But they often they have uh, recognized and granted broad discretion to library boards and library professionals to build the collection and, and to give expression to the library's mission and values through that collection. So there isn't a positive right to demand a place on the library shelf in public libraries. Um, and your collection development policy will co can codify that by setting, stand, uh, setting the criteria for collection. Uh, you must have a clearly identified uh, criteria for selection and also for weeding of materials that is objective, that relies on professional resources, that acknowledges the fact that you might not agree with everything. Another provision that we often recommend is having what we call either a controversial materials or a non-endorsement statement in a collection development policy. One is to acknowledge the library will acquire controversial materials. There may be a reason um, if there is a book that is particularly controversial, it may be that someone wants to examine it to understand the controversy or to even build arguments against it, which doesn't mean that the library endorses that book or its viewpoint. So Mein Kampf might be the most simple example in this case, but there are other books that have raised controversy now and in the past that libraries should have on their shelves as to the right for acquiring books, uh, clearly defined gift policy and donation policy should be in place that makes it clear that any book that comes into the library has to meet the collection development criteria, that inclusion in the collection is not an automatic gimme, and that it's within the discretion and decision making of the library's professional staff to decide what goes on the library shelf or is included in the library's collection. All of that goes to say, too, that li courts trust libraries and their commitment to intellectual freedom to not make discriminatory decisions. And we haven't yet run into a situation where someone has questioned that, but I doubt very much that anyone would succeed in a lawsuit by saying that they had a positive First Amendment right to place books on the shelf. Um, by having clearly, well, clear and well-written policies that are detailed um, in the manner I've described, I think libraries can establish the policies and protocols that they can easily defend in court should any kind of legal challenge arise. Okay, so next question, uh, I'm toggling between our, our live uh, questions that we're getting, and we're definitely getting quite a few about social media, and I'm pretty certain when I researched you both that you didn't work for a social media tech company, so uh, you don't have, you know, a dog in this fight, but uh, the question we had in the chat, was social media so prevalent, we live in a time when anyone without regard to truth and facts can post, publish, and promote falsehoods. The past year has revealed how dangerous this is to the very vitality of our democracy. 
how does and how should the First Amendment impact this reality while also maintaining the most important amendment? And that's for whoever would like to sure. take, a, take, take a go at it. I'll take go a crack for at it. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like the, the question about private schools in that uh, you've got Facebook. It's a private company. It sets its own rules for what's on its platform. So, you know, for instance, when somebody's post is taken down, a lot of times they'll be like, well, this violates my First Amendment rights. And mm -hmm. it does not. It's, it's more akin to like, you know, I, I'm part of a book club and I always think they're going to kick me out because I, I always want to change the subject away from like whatever book we were supposed to read. And they can do that. Not a First Amendment violation, just they're right in, in the sense that they're like, we don't want to associate you. Facebook can do the same thing. Um, they err on the side, I'd say, of like a lot. I mean, their policies have changed a lot. And in fact, they change with every incident that comes up and catches public attention, it seems like. But while they're allowed to moderate their content that's, uh, that is posted on their site, they're also not legally responsible for content that's posted on their site. Um, that, that's because of a really boring call, uh, sounding law called Section 230 of the 30. Communications Decency Act. Um, but yeah, they, it's considered like they're kind of a bulletin board. You post your stuff. Um, they can moderate, but they're not, and, and that's fine, but they're not responsible for what other people post which is all well and good, but as the questioner said, like a lot of bad stuff has happened since then. Um, and if there's an answer, I have no answer to this and how to make this better because on the one hand, I do believe that there's, in the landscape we live in, we're, we're all seeing some crazy, horrible negative effects, but I do believe there is value that more people have a voice and that more people are able to share things that have happened to them, to others, um, and we don't just have the channels of traditional media, which, you know, historically were restricted quite a bit. Um, so I think that that's been a good thing. Um, but that said, you do have this, this framework where the First Amendment doesn't really apply one way or another. It doesn't say that Facebook has to leave something up. It doesn't say Facebook has to keep, take something down. Um, and you have essentially like norms and laws that are built by private companies. And those actually have like I'll have a lot of influence over the public conversation and what we see and what we hear and that's scary it's not ideal I said it wasn't ideal for the government to determine what's true or false not really ideal for Facebook to do that either um so I'm, I'm not really giving you a good answer to your question the only thing that I would say is that I think we do spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of speech is allowed on social media which you know I, I understand that but again, to me, the bigger question is like, all right, so we have, if everybody's allowed to say whatever they want, okay, but where is our attention going? Like tons of terrible things are said online every second, but why, why do certain things seem to like capture a lot of people's attention? Why do certain um, videos just get seen more than others? Like what, what are the factors there? Whether that's algorithms or Twitter bots or hostile actors, like where, why, why are certain things like in our consciousness affecting how we think about things? And I feel like that question isn't asked nearly as much as like, well, that person should be banned, which it's like, that, that's another question. But yeah. I think a real thing is like, why is that particular rhetoric or that particular post like funneled our way? Why do you see what you see when you open up an app? Yeah, yeah I, I think that those are real fundamental questions. And yeah. I don't have an answer either. And I'll have to say that I've seen an evolution in communication. Um, email was barely a blip when I finished my law training. I'll be honest, you know, um, we were just beginning to use computers regularly in legal practice. And, and now, you know, anyone, everyone has a platform. I mean, I think we can all agree that I don't think I want a government agency deciding what should or shouldn't be on social media. But once we get past that, I think that we, um, it's just a difficult, challenging situation. Content moderation is a difficult situation to deal with. Um, we're now facing, you know, I, I'm thinking about in particular the proposal or Apple's decision to stop monitoring uh, the content of iPhones for child sex abuse materials. And I think about what a, I feel violated by that decision in some ways, even though 
I know that their motivation is good. And I think as a society, uh, um, as a democracy, we have to start grappling with these issues and deciding how we're going to deal with it. I don't think common, you know, there's this concept called common carriage, treating social media as common carriers to create a situation where we could regulate them in some ways. Um, I don't think that's an ideal situation either, but and I guess what we're both saying is we're, it's a, I think it's a question that society and, and government as a whole is struggling with, and no one has good answers. We've seen such rapid change in the space of little less than two decades with the methods of communication that we engage in that um, uh, it's, there's no real easy answer that, to any of this. If we did have an answer, then we should be in, like in charge of the world. So yes. yeah, absolutely. Okay. You know. Unfortunately, the people who are making decisions are all in um, the C-suite over at the social media, and I doubt if they're listening to us at this point. <laughs> Even though we are live streaming to Facebook, so hello, Facebook. Yes. Um, I am actually weirdly fascinated with Section 230, and in case uh, folks watching don't know, that was uh, put into effect in 1996, which was a time when no social media was really happening, because that was still kind of the early days of uh, the internet and computers. And it's part of the uh, United States Communications Decency Act. So that could be a whole other topic, I feel like, is why hasn't that been updated in all of these years with all of the things that we know now? Um, all right. Um, there are proposals to do just that right now. So. There are. So keep an eye out for Section 230 in your various news feeds. Um, OK. Lots of really great stuff happening, and I'm, I'm trying to make it a healthy mixture of uh, social media and real life things, but we did get a question which I know is always yet another million dollar question, and that is in regards to hate speech. So, uh, you know, Lithe, you gave that fun uh, example of the toxic apples in the grocery store and their comment is we don't have toxic apples in our groceries because we have regulations requiring safe food. <laughs> that is mm -hmm. true. Thank you. Uh, how can or does their respective organizations help to create or develop better regulations or guidelines or legal arguments concerning safe or safer speech in this wild west of social media? Since my, my toxic apples were brought up. Um, I mean, that would be to me the, like, yeah, the, the whole metaphor there is just that if you think of speech as a marketplace, a marketplace of ideas, yeah, you don't want tox toxic apples. There are laws against toxic apples. Um, I, that's why I think it's important not to think of it like that. It's not to think of speech as like a valuable good that you buy. It's more like a right that we all share. Um, and, you know, like, God, no, I'm, I was about to make another Apple metaphor. I'm not going to do it. There's no, <laughs> no, that's, I'm self-censoring here. Um, I do think that it's tricky that you see the social media companies who are trying to like, they, I, I actually used to track this. Um, you'd see their, their community rules, their standards for speech, and they would change every time there was like some kind of scandal, which makes sense. But I mean, one thing that also disturbs me about that is that like if somebody was famous and like a lot of people like realize like, oh my gosh, the content was taken down for this stupid reason, then there would be like an outcry over it and the policy would change. And then I, but I imagine that like, if you're not famous, if you don't have a lot of followers, like these things, like, you know, the world glosses over it, nobody notices. So I think that there's value in in, in some of the things that like the platforms have done, like Facebook's uh, like Supreme Court type effort, like in thinking of these things on a case by case basis and in like having rules that like um, that are transparent that people know about in advance um, to the best that you can. And uh, also, I mean, and again, this is why I thought the court thing was, was not a bad idea is just having an appeals process there because, you know, we social media is like nowadays you sort of need a Facebook account just to log into to half the things that you use. Um, so it is something where, uh, where I, I think it's a good thing that there are mechanisms in place to say appeal a decision. And I think that it, you know, it's, a, it's a huge challenge coming up with standards that work over the entire world. Um, and all I can say is that they develop and change with time. I hope that, I hope that they develop and change with more 
with more thoughtfulness and less reaction to whatever is like the public scandal of the day. So. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I'm going to, Go ahead, Deborah. I was just going to say in the context of libraries, you know, uh, in the marketplace of ideas, what libraries can do best is broaden what information is available and encourage everybody to access that information. Things like acknowledging the barriers to access post by, post, uh, posed by racist materials uh, and, and acknowledging their harms, but not necessarily removing them. Um, you know, uh, developing collections that emphasize diverse materials and promote the inclusion of uh, person, you know, materials written by um, and acknowledging persons of color, LGBTQ people. Um, we use the phrase developing windows, mirrors, and doors, having an expansive collection that reflects the experiences of everyone. Essentially, you, you know, one way to address this is to flood the marketplace with what we believe are good ideas, good, uh, good speech, good um, um, literature conversations, expand the possibilities, expand the ability to think critically about one's I, uh, what one is reading and things. So I'm being very nonspecific here, I, and I'm sorry for losing the thread, but um, you know, I think that that's the role libraries can play in this is to expand the possibility, expand the availability of information that challenges um, the hateful speech or bad speech. All right, so we had a couple different questions that are ants. They're asking similar things. I'm going to attempt to merge them, uh, but bear with me here. So they're both regarding uh, banned books, but this is still uh, open to both of you. Definitely interested in, in both your thoughts. So um, we had a question. They're curious from you what the thought process of people or organizations is when they ban books. Can you provide some background on how they think they are helping? Okay. So the first thing to understand, at least from our, in our experience, we very seldom see challenges or attempts to ban adult books meant for adult audiences. I think society has reached a consensus on that. We, you know, it's not that it doesn't happen, but we rarely see it happen, especially in the context of libraries where the big fight is, is over the materials available to young people. And I have to say that in um, addressing book challenges, I find that those who bring challenges have a sincere caring for the welfare of children. But what they think is good welfare, you know, that what would protect their child, a child's welfare is vastly different and based on values that probably have no business in the decision making of particularly an aid, uh, a government uh, supported entity like a public library. Um, and so they think that their own personal religious values, their own moral values should be part of the decision making and what materials are available. And we're seeing this most uh, strikingly right now in efforts to censor materials that are written for young people, intended for young people, developmentally appropriate, but are honest in describing the LGBTQ experience or expressing the concerns of LGBTQ people. Um, the number one most challenged book for the last two years in the country has been a middle grade book that is, describes the experience of a transgender child in elementary school, uh, George. Um, and there is a fierce effort to remove this. And they frame this as harmful to minors. They think that reading this book will do harm to their souls, to their minds, to their spirits. And they think they're protecting children when they do it. And, you know, you don't, you know, there, there is much that is wrong about that. But on the other hand, the, as you say, the underlying motivation there is they want to protect the children. But there's other values that come into play that uh, uh, other families and other families values that are important too. And that as a public agency, we have to give um, uh, 
that we have to acknowledge that and serve those information needs and not narrowly focus on one group's religious beliefs or values, moral values, and providing information. Um, but that that's really our experience. They really do care about kids, but we find that their way of caring about kids is uh, a way that often uh, suppresses ideas uh, and denies uh, the dignity and identity of many people as well. So Litha, um, this is in relation to the question that was just asked, and I'm gonna pose this to you first. Um, one of our attendees uh, is mentioning that a book, uh, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson, is being uh, called for it to be banned by a small, resident, a small group of residents in their community. And the school board tabled the matter for a future meeting, but they're wondering what are some really good resources for preparing remarks at public comment at a meeting to prevent the book span. So really thinking about like that engagement piece of how do you uh, make a stand against something like that. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, as a lawyer, I immediately think like, oh, what, what case law you would cite and stuff like that. But honestly, you know, thinking about what Deborah was saying, um, about that, uh, you know, oftentimes like people think a book is dangerous because it depicts a point of view that you wouldn't want ch your children absorbing. Um, I think one of the things that makes books so powerful, I, I was having a discussion with someone the other day about why they're more powerful than movies is because they are an act of, they're like the only form of media where you are inside a character's head, where you are living near their life. Um, movies like in television shows, you see people in a third person's perspective. They are apart from you. Whereas you, for all intents and purposes, you know what the character is thinking. You are the character when you're reading the book. And it's kind of a radical empathy thing. And I, I honestly see that why people would believe that that is dangerous or, or not what they want in some, in some cases. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. But <laughs> that's just one of those things where it's because of that power that people want to ban books. And I think, I mean, honestly, I would cite if I uh, cite to studies that show that like reading like um, increases empathy and mm -hmm. like, uh, I wish I could cite something off the top of my head, but Deborah, do you know what I'm talking about? I know they're out there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you know, there are, you know, it, it, they find that when you read about someone else's live experience, you develop greater empathy for their, you know, and, um, a greater consciousness about the experiences of other people um, and act accordingly. Um, it, we actually find that it doesn't necessarily change um, learned values, um, but does provide uh, an ability to understand the other. I mean, I'll be honest, I understand better the role of censors by reading their materials and listening to their concerns. And while I disagree with their solution to what they perceive as a problem, you know, I understand why they want to uh, challenge books, to ban books from libraries. Um, and I think that we all could benefit from that. But the kind of arguments that I would raise with a school board in particular, is to ask why, you know, to argue that um, as a community, it would benefit the community as a whole to understand the experiences of marginalized communities, especially those who've been justice involved. Um, and that as a parent, you want your child to be exposed to a wider world, to have those experiences, to develop that empathy. And that's the true goal of uh, a good education. And that as a parent, you would like your child to be able to read that. And that one parent's decisions based on their political views, their moral views, shouldn't dictate the curriculum for, or the reading materials available to the entire community. There's always a safety valve. And particularly in school libraries uh, and in school uh, curriculum collections, there's this provision that we always recommend that they include, which is the opt-out provision that accommodates the individual who has a differing viewpoint about a book. You don't want your child to read Just Mercy, that's fine. That's a choice you can make based on your own family's values, but that shouldn't dictate the choices or the availability materials available to other children, other students, other families. 
um, you know, in the end, you know, you have to remember that school boards have great discretion over what books are chosen to be in the curriculum. It's different than in public libraries. Um, and it does actually go back to some of the court cases we were talking about before about the profane cheerleader case. School boards have great discretion, um, but you can persuade the school board that as a taxpayer, as a parent, your choices are as important as someone else's and that you can, you would like to have the school um, support your, uh, the, the, the kind of empathetic education goals that you'd like to have and that your child has, uh, has should be entitled to read more broadly as part of their education than not. Um, there are court cases that deal with censorship in school libraries. Um, when a school board removes books from the school library based on a disapproval of the content or the viewpoint expressed in the book that can violate a student's First Amendment right to use the school library and to access the materials in the school library. Um, it, it even can extend to putting a book on a re restricted shelf. Um, um, one of my favorite anecdotes about library censorship is that a school board voted to put Harry Potter on a restricted shelf and require written parental permission to access the book because one parent had persuaded the school board that it was teaching children witchcraft and to defy authority. And the courts overturned that as they should. They said that that was an absolute imposition on the student's First Amendment right to browse the library and to read books of their choice. Um, I, you know, so some of this is advocacy, you know, they are hearing from one parent. They need to hear from lots of parents. So yes, I really encourage you to show up at that meeting and sp speak, your, uh, speak your piece to share your viewpoint, but encourage others who share your belief in a broad and liberal education to show up as well and to support the book. Because ultimately school boards are elected officials. They're responsive to the electorate. And if they only hear from one voice, they may not understand that there are other opinions and other viewpoints in the community. This is part of the democracy that we all belong to. And so, um, you know, engaging in this advocacy is probably the most important thing you can do. Uh, and frankly, if you'd like to reach out to our office, we'd be happy to help you with talking points. Um, Kristen Picall is our deputy director and she specializes in this kind of assistance. And you can reach us at OIF at ala.org and we'll be happy to help you. I cannot believe we are almost out of time. This has flown by so quickly. Um, and I just wanna thank you both so, so much. Before we wrap up, um, question to you both. Is there anything we didn't cover that you really want our audience to take away from this uh, discussion on censorship? We'll start with Litha. I feel like we covered a lot in, in a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that I want people to take away? You know, I'm just gonna, gonna say it. Uh, with the First Amendment, it's speech, religion, and press that get all the attention. I alluded to this a little bit, but petition and assembly are the ones that nobody knows. And lately I've just been very concerned about assembly because the right to protest, I feel like a lot of states and a lot of municipalities are cracking down on that. Our, putting into place laws that just make it harder, that make it uh, easier for people to be punished even if they haven't done anything. So, you know, mm -hmm. something to watch out for. Absolutely. Um, I think I just did it um, in my talk about being, uh, showing up and speaking up. I think we don't have enough of that. Um, we lose interest in local elections, we lose interest in the operations of local governments, and we can find ourselves in situations where a small dedicated group of uh, organized uh, advocates can take over an institution and operate it in a way that doesn't benefit the community. And we've actually observed that with uh, a couple of library boards in the last year where they were taken over. And uh, the new trustees are devoted to dismantling the library system and making uh, and reducing the information available in the community. And that, and so it matters. You have to show up, you have to vote, you have to go to public meetings and speak out and make sure that people understand that you value your public libraries, your public schools and the missions that they engage in so that these um, very loud 
voices that I actually believe are a minority don't dominate the conversation. And so I think that's what I, you know, that's the best way to fight the kind of censorship we're seeing and that we're concerned about today. It's so good. Sorry, just, yeah, the importance of like local institutions and what an impact you can make there. It's just- Absolutely, because ultimately all politics are local, <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, all of you watching out there to learn about the impacts of censorship and suppression as it relates to the First Amendment. Thanks to Lutha and Deborah for sharing your time and expertise with all of us. I, for one, learned so much. Um, and hopefully, you know, this is something that everyone can continue to educate themselves on beyond this presentation. And thanks once more to the Pittsburgh Foundation for supporting the work of the Civic CLP Speaker Series through generous funding. Uh, before you, you all leave, I know you're all already dashing off. We just have a few things to share. We'd really appreciate your feedback on how today's event went and ask that you please take a couple minutes to complete the survey that we've linked to in our chat. We're gonna also send this as an email to everyone that registered. Our library staff have created a book list of nonfiction titles to go along with the topics discussed today. And you can access those through the link in the chat comments section, several of which are available to borrow as digital downloads. And finally, if you'd like to learn more and register, register for the final event of the 2021 Civic CLP Speaker Series on October 14th with Ken Nwadake Jr., you can do so by clicking on that final link in the comments. Thank you all so, so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Thank you for having us. It was Have a great, a great, one. great conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely.